Thanks for coming in. Now, Peter, I'm, I'm fascinated by this because whenever we see... We always talk about institutional capture and the way in which this yeah. movement, whatever we want to call it, the woke movement, the critical social justice movement, yeah. it does... It clearly has, has managed to capture major institutions such as the military, such as the intelligence agencies, mm -hmm. such as the media, such as the cultural and artistic and educational institutions. Everything, basically. Everything. Yeah. So, surely the battle's lost, isn't it? Uh, I don't think the battle's ever lost, Andrew, but... I think it's going to be an uphill task. I mean, if you remember the beginning of the pandemic, mm. I think we discussed it even. Um, you know, people were saying, well, that's it for woke. You know, everyone's going to get serious now. Basically, uh, the days of that kind of frippery self-indulgence are over. And, of course, not only did it not go, it actually intensified, I yes. think, degree. And we had also, which is all part of it, uh, we had that extraordinary cultural attack that happened... Uh, around the time of the statues coming down and all of that, uh, a, a huge uh, right to all of our institutions, yes. decolonization, all of that. Um, I, ho I hope, I mean, optimistically, that this time it will be different because what we have seen is an extraordinary coming together of the West structurally, yes, in many ways. But I think that now is the time to really look at why we are considered by our enemies to be weak and to be decadent and to be self-indulgent and all of those things and basically try and get our house in order. And I think that, you know, if we don't do it now, then I'm just rather worried that it will never happen. Yes, but, I mean, you say that, but then, you know, as you said just then, when the coronavirus hits, when you've got an actual pandemic, people are really suffering and all of a sudden it feels silly to complain about someone using different pronouns for you or, or that kind of thing... And all those sort of strange articles in the New York Times, like, can my children be friends with white people and all this strange stuff. At that time, it felt like, well, that's going to go away because, like you say, mm. it just seems frivolous compared to actual problems of being of a pandemic. Mm. But it didn't go away, mm. got a, a whole lot worse. So why would this be any different? Why would it be... Why, why would this be different, this moment in history now? I think that in, an, in... I mean, I don't want to overstate things simply because... Things change very quickly. Yeah. But I think that what we've seen and how people have been inspired by Zelensky, for example, yes. which is pure, unadulterated patriotism and fighting for your country, and basically we're not going to, you know, we're not going to go down without a fight. Yeah. All of that. Uh, that I think has inspired people, and sort of thinking, well, actually, why can't we be a little bit more like that? Yeah. But I think that I'd say that you know, yes, it didn't go away during the pandemic but that somehow or other we've got to root this out. Yeah. It's not just a, it's silly stuff about... Uh, well, it's not just like, um, you know, bathrooms being, you know, uh, what is it called, gender... Gender neutral. Gender or, neutral or, yeah. and all of that. That's the kind of, you know, the, the, the silly side. It makes lots of nice stories. I suppose what worries me more is that the full-on attack on our history... Um, yeah. The f ..going through all the institutions, all our schools... That is seriously weakening us in the West. I think this is a really interesting point because a lot of people, when they think of these stories, and I cover them in this show almost to take the mick a bit, you know, stories about yeah. changing the name of the gypsy moth yeah. to the spongy moth, you know, and we can have a laugh about that, or the rain, painting everything in the rainbow colours in that mm. gaudy thing. Mm. And, and, you know, we, we, have, we can have a laugh about it, but it actually signals something a bit more sinister than that. Oh, know? absolutely. And also, you, you mentioned uh, the MI6 chief uh, during, you know, I think it was last week, he tweeted out saying, you know, I'm going to continue to tweet about LGBT rights, uh, you know, because that's the thing that marks us out primarily from, so, uh, from Russia, for example. Yeah. Well, first of all, that's not true, actually. But, but secondly, you sort of think, this is embarrassing. This is the head of MI6 at this time. We need to be taken seriously as a country. Yeah. And he is doing... This kind of thing, this trivia. I mean, I, I find it. Odd. I mean, I, you know, I think Russia has been terrible on gay rights, as yeah. it happens, right? And I think that's a legitimate point. Um, but you know, by suggesting that we still have an issue, we have equal rights for LGBT yeah, people. Yeah. We have that, so it's it's secured. Yeah, yeah. So, so what what is that all about? What, the, in other words, it's about priorities, right? Well, it's about priorities, but I would also say that undergoing, you know, underlying a lot of this sort of stuff that we've have been going on for what a few years now. Yeah. I would say is this sort of an attempt to sort of undermine our culture, undermine our confidence in ourselves, even right down now with the transgender thing, you know, undermine our very sense of ourselves, you know, the language too, how we express ourselves. This well, the idea of objective truth. Yes, in, in every way. But, but I think it's always, it's always being directed at the West and particularly the Anglospheric West. Well, talk me through that a little bit more. Um, 
underpinning this movement, this critical social justice movement, seems to be a sense in which the West was built on bigotry. Mm -hmm. The West was built on the suppression of minority groups to the advantage of heterosexual white males, mm -hmm. which strikes me as a... Now, there have been very powerful heterosexual white males in history, mm -hmm. but they weren't exerting their power in order to preserve their group identity. It seems like a very reductive, almost childish... A lens through which to view history. Well, this is the point. It is very childish. I mean, we're, our culture has become very infantilized. You know, I mean, it is, you know, and, and basically every issue or many issues now for these people is seen through how does this make me look? Yeah. How, how do I feature in this? What should my reaction be? And you just think this is how a child yeah. behaves. This the the narcissistic element of it. Very narcissistic. I mean, I quoted something. It was a very good article by... Matthew Said, I think it was, in the Sunday Times today. And he, there was this great statistic in it, which he was quoting from somebody else, actually. Apparently, students were asked, um, do they agree with the statement, I am a very important person? In 1950, they were asked this, and about 12% said, yes, they did. 12%? 12. 12. OK. 1990, 80%. What's causing that, then? Well, I think it's... Got, I mean, how long have you got, Andrew? But <laughs> what I'd say, it's, it's like a kind of dual action in a way. It's, on the one hand, I'd say it's a kind of rampant sort of consumerism where the person is seen just as someone who takes... Yes. You know, ..has to be satisfied, like a child. But then also I think it comes very strongly from the left, undermining all those institutions which put us in a context. Yes. So whether it's a nation, whether it's a family, whether it's you know, uh, our locality. All of these things are somehow, they have been chipped away at, uh, you know, our sense of nationhood, our patriotism. All of those things have been discredited, or rather they're trying to discredit them. So it comes down now solidly to the person, the individual, you know. And I, yes. if there's one thing we could take out of this whole crisis, for me, it would be, it would be great to start talking about we again as opposed to I. Yes, I understand. I mean, for me, it would concern me less if this were just the activists online making their noise, saying we need to decolonise all the cricket, yeah. tear down the statues, whatever, what bothers me is the figures of authority who then yeah. say, yes, OK, we'll go along with that. Yeah. You're making enough noise. Even though you don't represent the majority of people, yeah. we're scared of you, so we'll do what you say. Yeah. When Sheffield University put out that video saying that the only reason we study Ch Chaucer and Shakespeare is because they were white men... Yeah. And, you know, that's not just some idiot online, that's a university who are clearly not in a position to teach Chaucer and Shakespeare. If that's what they think, yes. they're not qualified to do so. So is this a legitimation crisis? Is this a crisis of the fact that those in authority have gone along with it? That's the problem. Well, I think they've, they've gone along... I think there are some who go along with it because they think it's the thing to do right. and they're under social pressure. But I also think that, that there has been... Our institutions generally have been hollowed out. Right. And that's universities, increasingly with schools... This is going to, going to become a very big thing, I think, Andrew, what, what kids are being taught in schools. Our, our, our museums, yeah. you know, all of these, they don't do any more what they're meant to do. They have become agents, they see, of social change, yes. you know, which is not what they're meant to be. But the overall effect, in terms of what we've been talking about, is to demoralise. It demoralises us. We feel that we are bad, that we're made to feel guilty, all of these things. None of that really adds up to a nation which is going to be confident or a culture which is going to think that it's a wonderful culture. And I think ours is a wonderful culture. I think it's a wonderful civilization. But it puts me off from going to museums and things, because if I'm going to an exhibition, I know I'm going to be lectured by the various uh, placards that are going to be put up <laughs> yeah. about how evil the country is and how evil the artist is. I mean, the, the Hogarth exhibition had a, a portrait of him in a chair, and the note said something like the chair would have been built from timber which was produced by slavery. So, therefore, the, you know, no, which, is again, really yeah. just a stupid thing to write. Um, and, you know, we can make fun of it. Yeah. But, again, it points to something bigger, a yeah. kind of malaise. It, it, it is an absolute malaise, which has come to... I think it's been gestating for a long time. Mm. Um, I tend to think there has been what they call a long march through the institutions. I, I, I do think that. And that's been going on. It's not a conspiracy. It's nothing like that. It's, it, people didn't sit down in a room at one point, maybe, and say, oh, we'll do this and that. I think that what's happened is there's been a slow march through the institutions. And what we saw in 2020 was things reached a real peak. It was the speed with which everything happened. Well, it just exploded in yeah. that summer, didn't it? And everything went, you know, absolutely massive. Mm -hmm. So how do we roll back? Because I, I know, speaking to academics now, uh, most of them who have an alternative viewpoint will just keep it to themselves. Yeah. They're not going to get promoted if they, if they yeah. you know, want to... You know, I, I've had people contact me about the various decolonising 
uh, groups are about the toppling of certain statues or the removal of certain statues, and they're just too afraid to say anything. Yes. Um, I think that people... It's very easy to say this, but people have got to try and have courage. I do think more people in the academic sphere, for example, there, there is more courage being shown. Yes. But I think ultimately it's got to be practical things. I think that if, for example, you are in charge of a, of a museum and you want to decolonise its collection, you should lose your public money, I'm afraid. Oh, really? You go that far? And I think we've got to go further than that. I think time has come where we've really got to start building our own institutions. I mean, America's got two famous colleges. Um, one is called Hillsdale. I think there's one in Austin. There's where, one in Austin, yeah. Yes. There's, there's Ralston College in Savannah as well, which is coming up. Right. So. We've got to start... It's harder in this country. We, get, we have less money. We have less people with money willing to put their uh, money where their mouth is. But nevertheless, that's what we've got to start thinking of. We've okay. actually got to build alternatives because this is so embedded that, frankly, it, it's unreformable. So you think it's too late? No, not too late. I, I hope I'm sh showing uh, possibly what we could do. It's just that as things stand at the moment, it simply cannot go on. So public money should be taken away if you're not doing the job you're meant to be doing, and we've got to build our own institutions.